Have you ever blown your stack and then almost immediately regret it? Maybe you hate the way that some things make you angry, even when you don't really want to be. Today, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to revisit a subject we've already touched on, and that's anger and how you should deal with it. And I guess the reason I'm coming back to this is because I've noticed a distinct trend. The collective temperature here in the West appears to be rising. People are more frustrated than I've ever seen, and I don't think I'm alone in noticing this. And, and I suspect it has the potential to become a big problem very quickly. Collective anger has a way of boiling over into serious problems for everybody. Not that it's the same thing, but some years ago I was visiting a prison in Rwanda where they were holding a lot of the people who participated in the genocide against the Tutsis. It was about 10 years after the atrocity, but of course the whole nation was still reeling from those unspeakable events. In fact, I encountered a number of places around that country where the bodies of unidentified victims were still piled up in makeshift crypts, because when you slaughter almost a million people, it's hard to deal with the aftermath, especially if you're in a country that just doesn't have a lot in the way of resources. And again, that's not really comparable to the rage I see sprouting up here in North America, at least not yet. But I also know that basic human nature is about the same all over the planet. And it really should bother us that more and more of these so-called protests in the streets seem to be erupting into physical violence. Historically speaking, we've discovered that it's a big mistake to say that it can't happen here, because it can. Witness the two different riots in LA, for example, and you might remember how quickly those got out of control. And then, of course, we've got the American Civil War and the French Revolution, both of which became literal bloodbaths. You and I are fooling ourselves if we think that our generation is immune to this stuff. We are, after all, still human beings, and we've got thousands of years of written history to remind us that no generation so far has been immune. Uh, of course, I'm not suggesting that we're sitting on the verge of an actual genocide here in North America, but when our collective rage appears to keep growing, it probably warrants our attention. And so I've decided to come back to the subject of anger one more time. The last time we talked about this, we discovered that anger itself is not actually wrong. It's a perfectly valid human emotion. The problem we face, however, is that our human moral compass is broken, and our personal anger tends to emerge from a place of selfishness to the point where righteous indignation is incredibly rare. We also saw that God Himself is capable of anger. The Bible talks about it clearly. And we studied what kinds of things might actually cause that. We looked at Mark chapter 3 where Jesus became quite angry about the way that religious authorities were standing in the way of a man who needed God's help. And knowing what I know about human nature and what the Bible teaches about the character of God, I would have to say that Jesus would be the only person, the only human being who ever experienced anger that wasn't tainted by selfishness or sin. It was the kind of anger you find in the fourth Psalm where it says, be angry and do not sin. Now, I, I don't know about you, but when I get angry, I fall dramatically short of that standard because even though it might have been justified at the very beginning when I first got mad, when I first felt the indignation, it always ends up being about me, my wounded pride, my inconvenience, my whatever. And I'm pretty sure the same is true for you. In fact, I know it is because you are also a fallen human being. The only example we have of holy, blameless anger would be Jesus. But that also means that you and I have an important reference point for gauging our own emotions, and we find a way that we can improve. God's anger, if you look at it carefully, is never about self. Typically, He's angry because somebody stood between the people He loves and the mercy He wishes to put on display for them. 
In the case of Pharaoh, which we looked at last time, God becomes angry about the way his people are treated. And he's angry about the fact that Pharaoh won't stop. And it's not just the Egyptians. If you read your way through the entire Old Testament, you'll also find God getting angry with his own people. Why? Well, they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. But instead of accomplishing that mission, they became focused on self and ended up emulating their pagan neighbors instead of actually helping them. They had actually become a barrier to God's intended work. And you'll notice the same was true when Jesus got mad. The religious know-it-alls didn't care about a man who needed his help. So it seems that that's what it takes to make God angry. In fact, listen to this amazing passage from Exodus chapter 22, where it says this, You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn. Now, one of the key differences between your anger and God's anger is that God actually gets angry on behalf of the people we hurt. It's not about self. And as a father, I kind of get this. If somebody hurts my kids, I get pretty hot under the collar. But at the same time, can I honestly say that my anger is completely untainted by sin? No. And you can't say that either, because at the end of the day, your fallen heart is always going to make it about you, at least a little bit. Now, again, that, that doesn't mean you should never feel angry, because of course you should. But it's how you do it that matters. The wrong kind of anger not only hurts other people, it also takes a pretty big toll on you. In fact, Harvard researchers concluded that people who get angry a lot are about five times as likely to have a heart attack and three times as likely to suffer from a stroke. Why? Well, explosive anger often puts us in fight or flight mode, the same kind of high intensity experience you get when you run into a hungry mountain lion. Your body goes on high alert, which is a good thing because you've been designed with an instinct to survive. The surge of adrenaline is what gives you the energy to either fight the animal or move yourself away from it. But what's happening here in the West is that we've abused that natural mechanism. Our stress levels keep rising because we're living artificially. We have high-paced lives that generate the fight-or-flight mechanism far more often than it's supposed to go off. It happens more often, and it lasts a lot longer than it was supposed to. And when anger becomes one of your go-to outlets for dealing with that stress, it taxes your system in really brutal ways. Plus, if you're getting angry the wrong way, it keeps the focus on self, your needs, your wishes, your desires. And it does that in a way that amplifies your ego in all the wrong ways. Remember, in the Bible, righteous wrath appears to be about others, but our anger tends to be about self. Of course, an another key problem is the seemingly involuntary nature of anger. I don't know about you, but I'm not always in control of when I get mad. Sometimes the, the pot just starts boiling before I've even had time to think about it. The adrenaline starts pumping and I start to get irrational. I mean, there's a reason we sometimes refer to anger as losing your cool. And I don't know about you, but one of the things I hate most about getting mad is that when it's over, I know I lost control. And I don't like losing control because it can lead to regret. Just think about how often you have replayed what happened in your brain the next day, wondering what you might have done to get a different outcome. It's not unlike seeing a video that someone took when you're drunk. You can't believe that's really you doing and saying all those idiotic things, but there's the proof, large as life, and it happened because you chose to abandon self-control. Something similar happens when you get angry. The adrenaline pumps, your heart races, your peripheral vision narrows, and you begin to react to the situation as if your life depended on it. But of course, it wasn't actually the emergency that your anger suggested. I'll be right back after this. 
at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. For most of us, angry feelings are kind of involuntary. You didn't really want to get mad, it just happened. You don't enjoy the way that anger compromises your capacity for rational thought, but it's not like you wanted this to go down. Something interesting happened after the Roman Empire officially legalized Christianity. Cities where the faith had been prohibited were suddenly alive with preachers, and so there were some Christians who figured that the cities had already been conquered for Christ. The devil, obviously, had been run out of town. So what did these people do? Well, some of them chased the devil into the wilderness to keep fighting against him. But when they got into the desert and moved into their caves or climbed up on top of their poles like Simeon Stylite, they found a much more difficult enemy. Because there's something about quiet solitude that strips away the distractions that keep you from struggling with the truth about your own fallen nature. It's just you and your thoughts out there. And the flaws in your character suddenly present themselves, like a fire-breathing dragon at the back of the cave. One history I read talks about a poor abbot who ended up wrestling with his own anger problem for 14 years. It just doesn't take long for most of us to realize that we have religious alternatives. These ways we try to quiet our conscience when it reminds us that we have a fundamental flaw. Some people will choose to believe that sin really isn't all that bad. I mean, surely God is just too nice to be upset by the way I behave. Other people turn to the prosperity gospel, assuring themselves that what God really wants in this world is to make you rich and successful. And then some people convince themselves that what God wants most is for you to support a particular political candidate, or He wants you to latch on to the most recent conspiracy theory. There's no shortage of religious distractions. And in the short run, all of these things are an easy way to avoid confronting the shame you feel when you suddenly begin to see yourself the way you really are. There are people who try to avoid that moment by picking up a religious checklist, trying to prove themselves to God, making check marks every time they believe their behavior vindicates an imaginary goodness. They remind themselves, I really took a moral stand in that business meeting. I gave all my neighbors a gift basket for the holidays. I donated money to this or that. It's a list of worthy causes. I mean, those are all things we should all be doing. But if that's your focus, you never get to the root of the problem. You're still avoiding the truth about you. So maybe let's ask a really important question. Where does anger come from? Why do you find yourself frustrated when the words and deeds of other people cut across the plans you've been making? Most of us are able to convince ourselves that if the people who made us mad would go away, our problem would be solved. But I can promise you that doesn't work. I mean, sure, getting away from problem people really can make life easier, and there are times you need to do that for your own good. There are. Sometimes there are people you have to remove from your life. That's just true. But the core of the problem can follow you if you don't understand it. The wrong kind of anger is simply one of those horrible side effects that comes from being fallen. It turns out that sin is more than just a list of naughty deeds. It's more like a devastating rip in the fabric of your soul. You and I don't just commit sin. We are sinful. It's a fatal and tragic flaw. And it makes a mockery of what human beings were supposed to be when God first dreamed us up. In order to conquer the dragon of rage, you're going to have to identify it and call it out for what it is. Of course, that's an idea that most of us hate, the thought that we have personal problems. It's easier to lay the blame on somebody else. But you're just stalling. You're avoiding the confrontation you really need, and that's an honest look at yourself. Let's take a look at the story of Cain, because at the very moment when that story begins to reveal Cain's deep-seated pride and jealousy, God suddenly confronts him and gives him an opportunity to look in the mirror, to see the real problem. Here it is now from Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, that's a really good question, don't you think? Why are you angry? Try asking yourself that question the next time you feel your temperature rising. Step out of the fray for a moment. Shut off all the external noise, get by yourself, and then study the nature of your frustration. Why does it make you so mad? Has somebody really violated your dignity? Or is some of what you're feeling based on your imagination and amplified by pride? If we say we have no sin, the Bible reminds us, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Until you make things right, until you face the fact that you also fall short of the glory of God, until you own what you are, life is always going to feel like you're living a lie. But if you name your anger, if you're honest and specific about it, that means you've finally begun to own the problem. And at that point, when the diagnosis is clear, you can give informed consent to the great physician so he can tackle the problem. If we confess our sins, the Bible continues, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession means that you can finally step away from the situation and look at it from God's perspective. Owning your brokenness, recognizing it for what it is, is going to set you free in ways you couldn't possibly imagine. When you finally admit how helpless you are, that you have a problem you can't repair, you're going to find it liberating. You can't fix what's fundamentally wrong with you, but the Creator can, and He will. You know, sometimes I encourage people to try a bit of the 4th century hermit experience. Not, not that I believe in asceticism, but it does kind of make sense to remove yourself from the problems that come from living with others for just a little while. Now, pulling away from civilization completely and for good that would be contrary to the marching orders Jesus gave His church. He, he didn't say, disappear into the wilderness. He said, go into all the world. But still, at least for me, there's something really compelling about those ancient desert monks. They were able to visit desolate places where they had to confront the darkness in their own hearts. And a lot of them were surprised by what they found when it was just them and the voice of the Spirit. So maybe we'd all do well to find a little bit of solitude now and then. Go silent. No phone, no social media, no TV, no radio, no internet. Just a copy of the Bible and you. And if that thought makes you panic, that might just say something about your addiction to distractions. Get by yourself. Start to take inventory. And when it comes to the anger that most people carry, examine it carefully. Because in quiet prayer, it's going to show up. And then start taking notes. Who are you angry with? What exactly did they do? And why did that make you angry? Be really blunt and ruthless. This needs to be the truth. And once you're done, go back and read those notes. Is all of it really righteous anger? Is your anger the kind that God could agree with? Or does it seem like a lot of it actually starts with you? Your frustrations, the hurts you've suffered, the betrayals. Is it possible that some of those things have understandably made you more angry about life and things that really shouldn't matter? Is it possible that you're projecting your pain onto other people who had nothing to do with what originally happened to you? Are you reacting to triggers? Be honest with yourself, and I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. You know, sometimes you've got to wonder how much of the frustration and anger we experience is actually a product of worry, the practice of borrowing trouble from the future. The, the fact that life is difficult can generate a lot of anxiety, especially when you consider the big mess we're all living in right now. Maybe you're starting to realize that old age is coming faster than you thought, and you're worried about how you're going to support yourself when you can no longer work. So what do you do? You make better plans. You save a little more money. And of course, that's a good thing. But then somebody comes along with a new tax or with policies that cause inflation, and that stirs up a lot of anger. 
Or, or, or maybe you're at the young end of your life and you're planning a wedding two years out. Anybody who's ever planned a wedding knows there's lots to worry about. Finances, the weather, the way some people respond when they find out they're not in the wedding party and, and, and so on. Then on the week of the big event, the forecast suddenly predicts thunderstorms. I knew it, you say, because this is one of those things you really worried about. Anxiety blossoms into frustration. And when easy answers refuse to manifest themselves, frustration can suddenly explode into anger. Now, again, planning for the future is something you should be doing. The Bible's pretty clear about that. But to repeatedly borrow trouble from an imaginary future is to kill your heart with anxiety. And it's living contrary to the advice that Jesus actually gave us. Listen to what he said. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, I want you to notice that is not a suggestion. That's God telling you to stop being anxious. He's saying you've got a choice. You can choose to stop. And there's a way to start reprogramming your mind so that it doesn't happen nearly as often. Jesus goes on to say this in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, take a look around you. I know the birds behind your house don't have bills to pay, and they don't have to worry about job security or medical insurance. But still, God tells us to look at them and contemplate their existence. They spend their entire lives just being what God intended. They're not trying to become something. They're not trying to justify their existence. They're just playing out the role assigned by God. And of course, we find these creatures irresistibly beautiful to the point where we can't resist looking at them. All of that magnificent natural beauty, Jesus said, is less important than you. Those things are dispensable, but God doesn't think you are. And if only we would choose to believe that, if only we understood that He really does plan to wipe away our tears like it says in Revelation 21, well, whatever happens to us between now and then really isn't going to seem all that overwhelming. Just listen to how Jesus wraps this up. He says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day, is its own trouble. Now that was a really big concept. It's God's solution for anxiety, which often lies at the root of anger. God says, live in the present as if today is enough for now. Stop living in the future. Stop borrowing trouble that doesn't even exist yet. Mark Twain said, worrying is like paying a debt you don't owe. And now I'm going to suggest something else that ties into this. And that's to stop living in the past as well. I mean, yeah, the past is important because it shaped you. You want to remember it. You want to remember the lessons you learned and how it made you the person that you are today. But at the same time, it can be tempting to live back there almost full time, bathing in the pain you experienced. It might be helpful to remind yourself that apart from the books of heaven and the memory of God, your past doesn't actually exist. I know, science fiction says your past is still being played out out there in the universe somewhere. It's a destination you could visit if you had a time machine, but that's science fiction. In reality, it's over, it's gone, and it doesn't have to determine how you live right now. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. 
Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Some Christians get understandably worried when we venture too close to that final statement in Matthew 6, the one where Jesus tells us to stop living in the future and anchor our minds in the present. Why does that make some Christians nervous? It's because it resembles a practice from Eastern religions that some people call mindfulness. Mindfulness is a form of meditation where you anchor yourself in the present by focusing on something that occupies the present. And most of the time, they'll tell you to focus on your breath. It's an attempt to quiet your mind by riveting your conscious attention on something. And of course, one of the reasons that Western Christians get nervous is because these practices are often coupled with religious ideas or deities that are completely antithetical to the teachings of the Bible. So, let me be clear, there is a form of mindfulness that is not appropriate for Christians. But that doesn't mean we don't have a similar tool. Remember, Jesus said, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, couple that statement with his instruction to observe the world around you, and what you have is an authentic version of mindfulness that actually harmonizes with the teachings of Christ. I mean, after all, he didn't suggest this. He commanded it. The Bible counsels you to ground yourself in the present, to choose to live in it, because let's be honest, the present is all you have. Nobody gets tomorrow for sure. So maybe give it a try. Set aside time to go for a walk, but without your earbuds. When you go out the door, give yourself permission to slow down and live for once. Listen to the sounds of the world, the birds chirping, the dogs barking half a block away, the feeling of the sun on your face, the sensation of a gentle breeze. Pay attention to all of it. But instead of trying to empty your mind like they teach in Eastern religions, or instead of chanting some meaningless mantra, have a discussion about you with God. Fill your heart and mind with Him. Maybe memorize just one line of Scripture before you go out the door and then discuss that with God. Think about how you might apply that to this day right now. Live that moment fully in the presence of God. Look. Tomorrow is going to come soon enough, and so will next week. But right now, all you've got? Today. And at some point, if you're filling your mind with what it teaches in this book, you're going to trust God more. You're going to start to trust Him enough to give Him access to your once angry heart. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thanks for joining me this week. This has been another episode of Authentic. Hey, thanks for watching Authentic. Would you be willing to do me a favor? Like, subscribe, and drop a comment. That really does help the algorithm put Authentic in front of more people. And it's free. So go ahead, like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you.